Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to Microbiology Lesson on Microbial Adaptation. We're going to cover two out of the four outcomes we have for this topic. The four being, you should be able to discuss signal transduction, enzyme induction and repression, quorum sensing, and taxis or microbial movements. Now, as we go through the four subtopics, I want you to keep in mind the paradigm underlying them, which is that these adaptations serve three goals. The first one is survival, to prolong life, to live as long as possible. The second is reproduction. Microorganisms want to duplicate their genome for future generations. And thirdly, you can think of microorganisms as trying to survive as a collective rather than individual cells. So their adaptation strategy might cause the loss of a small number of the community members in order to allow the, the larger community to live on. So that's the adaptation paradigm that we use here. Okay, the starting point of adaptation is sensory. So microorganisms need to sense what's around them. Then they will transmit and convert the signals into cellular response. That process of transmission and conversion and all the molecular events associated with them, we call them signal transduction. Now, be aware that this is different than the transduction you learn in virology or microbial genetics. That one refers to um, it's when you've got a viral vector, like a bacteriophage. So it's when you've got a viral vector transferring DNA from one bacterium into another. So we call that transduction. This one is called signal transduction. Signal transduction is regulated by a system that has two components. The first one is sensor kinase. The second is response regulator. The role of the sensor kinase is detection. When it detects environmental signals, it autophosphorylates. So if you recall lessons from your organic chemistry or biochemistry classes, you would have learned that kinases are enzymes that transfer phosphate groups. Organisms use phosphate transfer like a, like a financial transaction where the phosphates are the currency, the currency of energy to keep things moving. Um, usually ATP is involved. So in autophosphorylation like this one, instead of the kinase transferring phosphate groups from ATP to other biomolecules, in autophosphorylation, it transfers the phosphate group to itself. When it does this, in sensor kinase, the binding of phosphate occurs at the amino acid called histidine. So, in the scientific literature, sometimes you're going to see that sensor kinase is called histidine kinase as well. Alright, we have two components of the regulatory system. The first one is sensor kinase, the, sense, the second one is response regulator. So the first thing that happens is sensor kinase detects environmental changes. When that happens, sensor kinase autophosphorylates. Now, after that autophosphorylation, the sensor kinase will give the phosphate to the response regulator. The response regulator now has the phosphate, right? So when the response regulator has the phosphate, it triggers its conformational change, which means the shape of the response regulator changes. When the shape of the response regulator changes, that change allows it to bind to DNA. When it binds to DNA, it starts to regulate the DNA transcription. And this will produce proteins that help the microorganisms to adapt to the environmental changes. Now, we, we have a classic, well-studied example of two-component regulatory system. It's in E. coli. It's called ENVZ OMPR system. Remember, we have two components of the regulatory system. The first one is sensor kinase. The second is response regulator. So in this example, the ENVZ is the sensor kinase and the OMPR is the response regulator. 
Okay, I'm going to leave you a link to an article for you to read. Um, it's a less technical explanation, so it should be understandable to you as a first year students. It has a fuller story of ENVZ OMPR system and its um, regulatory role in osmolarity. You can read that later, but for now, I just want you to focus on the two component regulatory system, okay? So it's called ENVZ or MPR system. ENVZ is the sensor kinase, or MPR is the response regulator. So step one, ENVZ detects changes in the environment. In this example, changes in osmolarity. Step two, ENVZ autophosphorylates it transfers phosphate to itself. Step three, ENVZ then transfers the phosphate to OMPR. That transfer causes a conformational change in the OMPR. Step four, the conformational change allows OMPR to bind to DNA. And step five, that binding regulates the DNA transcription. That's it. Then the DNA will be transcribed to express proteins called OMPF and OMPC. Um, don't worry about their names, just know that they are proteins that regulate osmolarity. So you have environmental changes, your sensor kinase detects it, it autophosphorylates, it then transfers phosphate to response regulator, the regulator undergoes a conformational change, and that conformational change makes it bind to DNA, and that binding regulates DNA transcription. Okay, that's the basic. All right, now, I want you to note that what I just taught you uh, can be a single part of a larger network. I'll leave you another paper if you're interested in learning more. Um, this one will not be in the exam. I just want to open that door for you if you want to go deeper. So, that was signal transduction. Now, the second aspect of microbial adaptation is enzymatic regulation, where the microorganisms induce and repress enzyme activities. You can think of this as the way microorganisms adapt to how much food is available. So when they are in an environment where nutrients are hard to come by, they do three things to adapt. Number one, they synthesize more enzymes that help with uptake and metabolism of the limited nutrients. So basically, they can eat and process the food more efficiently. That's number one. Number two, they synthesize enzymes needed for different nutrients. So here, instead of saying, let's be more efficient in eating this food that um, we're running out of, um, instead of that, the bacteria say, Let's work on eating something else, an alternative source of nutrients. Okay, so that's the second one. And number three, they adjust the rate of nutrient metabolization, meaning they work on eating slowly, prolonging their survival until the source of nutrients become abundant again. All right, so try to understand and memorize these three. Now, enzyme expressions are of different types. I want you to focus on differentiating just two of them, which are constitutive enzymes versus inducible enzymes. Constitutive enzymes are the ones that microorganisms express constantly. Well, microorganisms and larger organisms too. The genes for these enzymes are expressed constantly. They make enzymes for for example, for the electron transport system or for glucose consumption, which are the kind of stuff that we need all the time. The second one, the inducible enzymes, as the name implies, are only expressed when they are induced. They are induced based on environmental changes. A, a popular example of this would be the operon theory. An operon is a group of genes. It consists of four components, structural genes, regulatory site or uh, operator site, regulated gene, and repressor protein. So consider lactose operon or lac operon. When the environment doesn't have lactose, the regulated gene makes the repressor protein. 
this repressive protein binds to the operator's site. And when it's there, it blocks the RNA polymerase. When the RNA polymerase is blocked, it can't transcribe the structural genes. And without that transcription, the operon cannot make enzymes that consume lactose. On the other hand, when lactose is present, the lactose binds to the repressor protein. And because of this binding, the repressor protein can't stick to the operator site anymore. In other words, the repressor protein is deactivated. And when it's deactivated, when it's not blocking the operator site, the RNA polymerase can do its job. It starts to transcribe the structural genes, which express the enzymes that consume lactose. Then later, when the enzymes have used up all the lactose, the environment becomes lactose deprived again. And because there is no more lactose, lactose can't bind to the repressor protein. And without that binding, the repressor protein can now attach itself to the operator's site again. And that attachment to the operator's site will block the RNA polymerase. So because of that blockage, the operon can't transcribe the structural genes and the genes can't encode for enzymes that consume lactose. So that's it. That's a clear example of how enzyme induction works. Now, the opposite of enzyme induction is enzyme repression. It usually regulates anabolism. So these are for substances that microorganisms need to grow. The classic example of this one would be tryptophan operon or trip operon. Remember just now, in lacoperon, when the lactose binds to the repressor protein, it deactivates the repressor protein. It shuts it down. In trip operon, it's the other way around. When tryptophan binds to the repressor protein, it activates the repressor protein. So because of that, when you've got too much tryptophan, the repressor protein will block the tryptophan synthesis. And then there is something called attenuation. Sometimes the trip operon can start, but it stops prematurely. It doesn't finish synthesizing the enzymes. So that mechanism is called attenuation. Another mechanism is called catabolite repression. We're going to end with this. So remember I said just now that enzyme repression typically regulates anabolism. So that's true, but it can get involved in catabolism as well. So imagine an E. coli community with access to both lactose and glucose. We use E. coli as an example because earlier we just learned about lacoperon. So which basically means when the environment only has lactose, E. coli activates their lacoperon to consume lactose. Now, when you have lactose and glucose, E. coli doesn't activate their lacoperon. They ignore those lactose. Why? Because their metabolism prefers glucose. They eat glucose first. When the glucose runs out, then they start activating the lacoperon again. So, so that they can consume lactose. You see? So this is what's referred to as catabolite repression. When glucose is abundant, the glucose exert catabolite repression towards the lac operon. So the lac operon can't activate even though lactose is there. All right, let's stop there. Go over this audio again after you've gone through the reading materials. It should be clearer when you listen to this the second time around. Okay, talk to you in the next one. Barakallahu li wa alaikum wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.